become acutely aware of the grace, mercy, and peace that comes to each of us through the gift of his Son, our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we are gathered today, dear people of God, amen. It's a great time. This is the last Sunday before we enter the season of Lent, as we will start Lent this week with Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday night. But it's a special time of the year because Lent is looked at as the season of repentance. And it's a time in which God is encouraging and asking us to look at ourselves and to reevaluate where do we stand before God. The, are we following his example? Are we following his encouragement? Are we feeling close to him? Or are we letting ourselves be drawn away? And the disciples were experiencing the same thing. And we have today on Transfiguration Sunday, Jesus took three of his disciples up on the mountain. But what do they do every time they go on a mountain with him? When he prays, they sleep. I guess it's the Lutheran way, isn't it? It's just proof that there were Lutherans among the disciples. Yeah. And occasionally on Sunday, I see those eyes close. Yeah. But I will get even. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But he takes the disciples up, and as Jesus is praying, they fall asleep as, as they would have many times in their time together with Jesus. But as they're sleeping, suddenly, with Jesus, appear who? Elijah and Moses. Wow. Elijah and Moses. We're going to talk about them in just a minute. But Elijah and Moses depart as, as the disciples awake and as they're realizing what's going on around them. And then what happens? Their cloud comes down and it encircles them. It's like fog they can't see. They cannot even see that Elijah and Moses are departing. But they're standing there before Jesus, whom they didn't recognize because he looked very different to them. It's probably the same reason that the women in the garden didn't recognize Jesus when they were walking with him. The disciples didn't recognize Jesus when they were walking with him because he was in his glorified body, his perfect body, and radiant. No suntan or sunburn or white, pale, chalky-looking skin. He was radiant and glowing. Perfect. Perfect. And they didn't recognize his perfection. But God speaks to them and God says, This is my son. My chosen one. Listen to him. Now the disciples had heard a phrase similar to this at Jesus' baptism. What did God speak at that time? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. But at the transfiguration, he goes yet a step further and not only says, this is my son whom obviously I'm pleased with, but this is my, my son, the chosen one. And to an Israelite and to the disciples who were very familiar with the teaching of the Old Testament and now the New Testament teachings of Jesus, they should have caught on that phrase, my chosen one. For what purpose? To save Israel. But through Jesus Christ, to save everyone. That all might come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. This is God's way of showing us that Jesus was one of a kind. He wasn't the first of many yet to come. He was in the middle of a lot of great prophets and teachers and speakers and great men of God. He was one of a kind. He is the Son of God. And God made that clear. This is my Son. Pay attention. So where does this take us? It's kind of like seeing the Mount Rushmore of heaven. The lawgiver, the prophet, the Messiah, all wrapped up in glory. You can imagine what the three disciples, as, as they open their eyes and and awakened from their slumber, and, and they, they got to look up there and say, man, there's something big going on. We're about to miss it. We need to figure out what's going on here. And, and, and it's kind of amazing because many times we ask ourselves, why was Elijah there 
Why was Moses there? And why was Jesus, now not just Jesus walking down the dusty trail, they see the Son of God who has come to save the world, the Messiah promised for 4,000 years. Wow. Remarkable. Amazing. And I think if you and I were there, like the disciples, we'd want to know, where do we go next? But we look at this, and we ask ourselves, Moses, why is Moses there? What does he represent? Moses represents a time in the history of Israel where Israel in captivity would be led out of captivity and would be led to freedom going through the wilderness, eventually being led into the promised land. If you go back and read that portion of Scripture, you remember that God stood with Moses overlooking the promised land. And as we read today in our Scripture lesson, he says, and this is the land I give to you. Nobody will ever take it away from you. This is your land. But you cannot enter. Moses was the writer of the law. Wrote, Moses wrote the first five books in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And our reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy, which is known as the book of the laws. And Moses knew what the law was. Moses knew it. Obey God. Good things happen. Disobey God. A price must be paid. And usually if you ask 100 people, why was Moses not allowed to enter into the, into the promised land, they'll say, because he killed that Egyptian. That's not it. That's a sin any one of us are capable of committing, a sin that any one of us can be forgiven of. And God forgave him, but God said there's a price to pay. And why was it Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land? Because he rebelled against God. And he got angry. And he decided to do it his way rather than God's way. And God said, that rebellion, that rebellion will not be allowed to allow you to go into the promised land. But God did something very special for Moses. He's never done for another human being in the history of the world. He let him die, and he took him in his own arms, and he picked him up, and he himself buried him. And as our scripture says today, no one in the 2,000 plus years since then has been able to find that grave that God says he did it. That's what he did. So Moses is there representing the law and representing serving God faithfully, but when you live by the law, you die by the law. And that's important for all of us as Christian people to remember. It's important that we all remember that. So where do we go? Elijah, the great prophet who foretold of the coming Savior, the Son of God, living under a, a non-righteous king, a king that allowed the people again to worship false gods, encouraged them to worship false gods, and put a price on Elijah's head and said to his hunter and to his military, find this guy and take his life. But what did God do? Again, God came to Elijah. And he said, you've been faithful in delivering my message even when it was not well received. Even when they threatened to kill you because of what I was wanting you to tell them. And again, God said to Elijah, come with me. And Elijah, like Moses, the only person in the history of the world ever to be placed into his grave by God himself. Elijah, the only person in the history of the world that ever went to heaven without dying. Think about that. And we have these graphic pictures of him in a chariot riding off into the fiery sky, passing on into eternity to be with God forever. The important thing for us to remember is next slide. Together, they were the witnesses to the truth. 
Moses, and Elijah. The witnesses to the truth. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the truth? What was Jesus doing and what was God doing through his son on that mountaintop on that day? What Jesus was doing, unbeknownst to the disciples prior to this day, Jesus was announcing his soon-to-be departure, that he was leaving. He didn't tell them how and when, but we know just a few days later they go to Jerusalem and Jesus dies for you and for me and for them. And we look at that, what Jesus is announcing is his exit from this earth as a human being. And it's, it's a reminder to you and me that we ought to be looking at our own lives and asking ourselves that question, how am I going to exit this world? Is God going to pick me up and put me in my grave himself? Is God going to put me on a chariot to ride off into the sky like Elijah? Or is God going to come back through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, and say, job well done, my good and faithful servant. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And if Jesus Christ himself can speak those words to a thief on the cross, don't you think he's going to be able to speak those words to you and to me? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Wow. So where do we go? As Christians, it's our job to trust. And we remember this famous quote from our famous president. Trust but verify. And that's a challenge I, that, that I share with each and every Christian on this earth. Trust God. Trust God to do what he's going to do. Trust God is going to bless us in the way in which he said he wants to bless us. Trust God is going to be faithful as he says he will be faithful. But how do we verify it? We go to his word. We go to his word. And we look at all the promises that God has made to us. We look at all the challenges that God allows to come into our life and how he says he'll get us through them. And we look at the word of God as he says to you, I will be with you always. Well, let's, try, let's, let's verify that. And we can do it. And we can do it because God is faithful. And God has given to us the blessed gift of his son, Jesus Christ, to be our living Lord and Savior. Not only that during this time on this earth that we might live life and live that life more abundantly, but that we might have the continuation and the extension of that to be with him in eternity and to be the children of God, and to be the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ in eternity, and to trust that when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, that he was talking about us, not just those disciples gathered in that room, but he's talking about us. And my next birthday, I'll be 72. I don't know how long I'll live in that. I don't even know if I'll make 72. But I know that when that day comes, whenever it is, I will be filled with excitement and enthusiasm because I know Jesus will be by my side and I know that God himself will take me to be with him in eternity. And I can verify that in God's word. I had a former brother-in-law who became atheist in his college years. He was a plasma physicist. Nobody yet has figured out what that is. But uh, I don't know what a plasma physicist is, but... But he wound up being in the computer industry and he invented and created those little microchips that go in our computers and our phones. And he, all that science and all that research and all that study he did turned him against God. So he said, I'm going to take a sabbatical and I'm going to spend one year of my life and I'm going to use that year of my life to prove that the Bible is false. And being a brilliant man, and he was, and he dedicated himself about 14 to 15 hours a day reading scripture, looking for the evidence, looking in history, looking in other historical documents, trying to find one time that God lied, one time that God failed to fulfill his word. And he came out of it, one of the most devout Christian men that will be walking on this earth today. He said, I failed. I failed miserably. But I found God. A God who he thought 
had deserted him. A God whom he thought did not care about him. A God he thought who was incapable of doing these things that we Christian people profess. And he said, the science, the research, the numbers, the facts say nothing else can be true other than God is real, Jesus Christ lived, Jesus Christ died, that I might live. And the numbers add up. Wow. God is the gift that he has given to us. Our, our encouragement in life is to say, behold his glory. You know, if, if there's anything, you know, we say the peace of the Lord, maybe some Sunday we ought to change it and say, and say behold his glory. Because when you behold his glory, you will find the peace of the Lord that passes all human understanding. When you behold his glory, you will not have those moments of doubt and let them lead you astray or take you away from God's desire and plan for you in your life. When you behold his glory, you become radiant. You become a person that others will become attracted to and want to find out. What's your secret, Bubba? I don't get it. You're always smiling. You always seem happy. You work. You go through the same difficulties as I go through, and you don't seem to get just drugged down by them. And the simple answer to that is because I behold his glory. And I know that's what awaits me. And that's where I will be, and I will share with him. So the truth is, we've, we've discussed this many times in this church and on, on Sunday sermons, that um, our brother in California pastor said, wrote that book about it's not about me, it's all about him. It is all about him. That's the truth. That is the truth. It is all about him. But in a unique sort of way, you can extrapolate that out. It's all about him. But because of that, it's really all about me. He didn't come here to, that we would glorify him. That was not his goal. He came here to save us to make us the children of God, to live with God in eternity. And that's the why. The truth is it's all about him, but the why is because he loved us so much, he was willing to make it all about us, about you and me. And thank God for that. And this is the answer to all the questions of our life. Jesus Christ... He came. He was a gift. We celebrated at Christmas. The shepherds were witnesses. And you see all the other words that appear there in that graphic. If only we could see that with our eyes every day when we open them. And instead of complaining about the cold or the rain or having to get up, what time is it? I sure wish I could sleep another couple hours. We could focus on the glory of God and what he has meant to us in the lives that we lived. And there's only one thing we need to know. One thing. Jesus came for you. Came for you. Now it's our choice. How are we going to respond? God has done his part. Jesus Christ did his part. And how God says to us, I've given you a spirit that allows you to do your part. What will you do? Stand with me, please. <clears throat> Let us pray together in Christ Jesus for all people according to their needs. <clears throat>